Welcome into the KSO Show on a Monday. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online as we are set, ready to go, get this final week of October underway. I guess technically there are a couple of days next week. They don't really count, though. Halloween's a bogus holiday anyway. So we are here, ready to rock and roll and uh, move on with everything going on in K-State football as the Wildcats picked up a second straight win. Uh, they look good in doing so. I'm not sure that the game could have gone really any better for them. 41 to three, they just dominated TCU over the weekend, and we did uh, obviously our video and recap immediately after the game. Dy, but now that the dust has settled a little bit more on the game, uh, do you have any other grand thoughts from the game and how it played out for K State and kind of what it means moving forward? Uh, just that the quarterback dilemma where we were honestly trolled a little bit by Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein for, you know, playing both Avery Johnson and Will Howard for the first snap. Somehow they made that probably a little bit more difficult on themselves yeah. moving forward. And that's not criticizing the way that they handled it or think that they handled it wrongly or anything against Will Howard or anything against Avery Johnson. It's just that both played well enough to where you're, you have the same situation except maybe a more excruciating choice ahead of you at some point that perhaps you have to make for the Houston game. Perhaps you have to make for it in two weeks against Texas, but at some time you're going to have to make that call on who to roll with. And, and the only time we've ever seen them perhaps have to do that was when they went with Avery Johnson in the second half against Texas tech and Lubbock. But uh, that time's coming even if they were able to alternate every series against TCU, I have a hard time seeing that be a sustainable or effective formula moving forward, whether it can be effective against Houston. That's another thing because I don't think Houston has a really good defense, but yeah, that's something that they're going to have to do. And I don't envy them because uh, they have relationships that might probably make that a difficult choice. And it's, honestly kind of challenging to decide who to roll with and maybe it will just be a game flow and hot hand situation like they do a running back maybe they do that every week uh does that throw off the chemistry and cohesion with the rest of your offense uh that that's for them to decide and certainly something to consider as well so again tough choice ahead of them i don't know what they're going to do i don't know what i would do but you know what that what is a sustaining formula in a winning recipe is when your offensive line is dominant. They have been for two weeks in a row, probably three of the four Big 12 games. So they go as that unit goes, and that unit completely obliterated TCU, to be quite honest, and it wasn't close in terms of you see one side face another one. And it's just a mismatch. It was in Manhattan on Saturday evening. Some bright signs at wide receiver, a few flashes here and there. Um, another, you know, Example of you probably have, might have more at tight end than just Ben Sinnott. Uh, maybe the best running back tandem in the Big 12, perhaps the country, on your side as well. And a defense that, man, um, when you stop an offense that is associated with Sonny Dykes or Kenna Bryles or even TCU in general, they haven't had a game where they didn't score off the touchdown, I guess, since 1993, according to Cole May <laughs> Cole Maybach from the Three Mall Podcast. So you're doing something right. It was a remarkable performance. It was um, a wow performance. And I still, like, I, I've been asked this a couple times since that game, like, what stood out about the defense? And I'm like, I don't know, really. <laughs> it was just a business-like performance that they just they only forced one turnover, not a bunch of splash plays. They just, it was business-like, got stops and did it, just playing fundamentally, fundamentally sound, I guess my – you know, the takeaway that jumps out at me would be would maybe be a couple players. Um, in terms of a collective thing, they just tackled a lot better. Um, I think that was big. They tackled so much better than they did in the prior two weeks. Um, they continued to control the line of scrimmage. But I guess guys that I would shout out as I think really dude stepping up into the run would be Desmond Purnell. You know, Chris Clement said he's playing at an all Big 12 level. I can't disagree. I don't think he'll get that nod at the end of the year, but I would probably agree with Chris Kleiman. And then VJ Payne. I think that dude is really, 
really coming on uh, and playing his best football of his career by far. And is probably someone also coming close to playing it at an all big 12 level. And then Keegan Garber, I, I think uh, that dude's playing tough in man coverage, not a liability when teams are at first, we're trying to attack him in that way. And he's shown that um, he can't be attacked in, in that way. So those are the ones that kind of stand out to me. Yeah. I mean, I, Keen Garber had some impressive breakups on Saturday too, um, to where he kind of stepped up and, uh, it was it was just a good sign. I mean, I, I wrote about it in, uh, when it came to, to doing position grades this week, but the longest pass play of the game that TCU had was 16 yards. I mean, it, a lot of teams have found ways to burn K-State all this season and in past years. 16 was the biggest play that they had through the air on Saturday, and that says a lot about how the secondary has started to play. And, you know, the safeties had turned it around – I think going back to the Oklahoma State game, I I think that we could start to see that they were playing better in that game. I think they were one of the few groups that, you know, I I thought played well. And then they were good, obviously, last week against Texas Tech, and it's easy to see that when they end up with three interceptions for you. But they also did some other things where they made an impact. And then, again, you know, they they came together and they played well against TCU. And I think we're just going to look back at uh, when Chris Kleiman made the comment about switching guys around and and just – positioning them differently uh, in, in the, their three safety spots, and they seem to have figured it out. Because even, you know, Marquis Siegel, he had another pick go through his hands, but he is starting to be around plays a little bit more, and he's not seeming as overmatched as he was earlier in the year. I think that there were some games where you could point to Marquis Siegel having some major errors that were costly for the K-State defense, namely the game in Columbia, uh, where, you know, he, his miscommunication – played a role in a couple of big plays for the Tigers. So, uh, you know, hats off to the safeties and how they're playing. And I I will put this down somewhere in writing this week. Marquis Siegel is going to get an interception against Houston this weekend. That is my that is my bet of the week for you. You know, it, it, I guarantee you you're not going to be able to find that on a sports book somewhere. But I'm just telling you, drop it to a buddy or, you know, say it to your <laughs> wife and she won't care or really know what's going on. But you're like, I bet Marquis Siegel number twenty one gets a pick this week, and I'm I'm going to be right come Saturday night. Uh, you think Donovan game. Smith is going to be generous with the ball, huh? Well, it's it's you know it's certainly in his DNA. The ball's going to be in the air enough for that to happen. When's, so, when's the last time the Cats played a starting quarterback? Uh, it would have to be well, it would be oh, Missouri. Does that because that boom? Does that count? Oh uh, yeah, well I guess. I guess technically, but that was the first game where Alan Bowman was the starting quarterback, I guess. Yeah, so, so it doesn't really count. Right? So yeah. I mean, It's wild. Well, K-State's gotten to play all these backup quarterbacks, and the one game where they didn't is the game in which Oklahoma State, who had been playing every quarterback on the roster, decided, now nah, we're going with one guy now. And look at how it's worked out for them. They've ripped off three straight wins, so. Yeah, Oklahoma State uh, power rankings are going to look good this week. Maybe. Yeah, actually, you know, everybody makes a comment about, hey, if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. I think we've learned this year that with K-State, you might be able to have one if you have two quarterbacks. But if you have three quarterbacks, you do, in fact, have none. And Oklahoma and, State has learned that. And if you play Manhattan, you probably have multiple because yes. your, your starter's always hurt. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. K-State, kind of the TCU of this season with uh, – just now getting, everybody's, getting everybody's worst at quarterback. So, uh, when we'll yours, see. yep, that's uh, that's significant news. We'll we'll talk about that briefly at the end, and hopefully by the end of us recording this, we'll have game times for uh, the following week when K State is at Texas. So uh, that will be a significant deal, and uh, we'll monitor that. But as we do every Monday, it's time to shift into our over and unders for the week to recap the game uh, in a slightly different way, and also keep ourselves honest and uh, let everybody know that we're not always as smart as we, we turn out to be. I will tease this. Maybe you, you can know just based off what your picks were in field DY. Only one of us was above 500 this week in the over-unders. So oh, I, I was hoping we were talking about best bets a little bit because one of us was undefeated, and I am crushing. Uh, yeah. I'll, let, I'll let you just take it in right there for a yeah, second. Yeah, you know, what did you say? I just victimized Pittsburgh. I, I took them yes. last the week before to upset uh, Louisville, and then I then I picked them to to let down against Wake Forest. Maybe I should just go Pittsburgh game. I no, I said I said not just Pittsburgh. I said you just victimize the teams that you build up the week before because 
Washington just coming off a massive win. You're like, yeah, they're they're not scoring 43 points this week, and they barely scored 14 points this week. <laughs> I know. I not, not I didn't just win this week. I crushed it yeah. because Kansas State was over 16 and a half in the first quarter. Yeah, no, it, it was um, it was amazing. And also, I mean, I got cheated on Iowa. You know, they take a punt back to win that game and cover. Although, uh, I the, the PJ call. Fleck. The P, it was a good call. And you just look at the video and it's like, I can see how that would be deceiving. And that, it, yeah, we, we don't have to dive into I didn't into know that the rule that as soon as you shoot guys away, it's even. Yeah. It makes sense, I guess. But yeah, uh, because you're always basically have Air Force. Give, and you're giving up on the play, right? So it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah you're, you're definitely trying to deke them there. So uh, another good week for DY in the best bets column. Yeah. Those were, uh, those were some big ones for you. Because, I mean, it probably became pretty apparent early that Washington was not scoring the uh, – Now, the Wake Forest one was tight. The Wake yeah. Forest one was tight. Yeah. Um, you rolled the dice on an Avery first score. He didn't score at all. No, he did not score at all. He, he threw a touchdown pass. What is that? That's not what we're supposed to be getting here. I mean, <laughs> come on. Uh, yeah, no. I I thought, you know, he'd be there and, and they'd throw him in. But, no, they they stuck to their guns. They let Will Howard ride it out, and Avery didn't even score a touchdown at all in the game. Uh, and you barely, the barely got the Air Force one. Yeah, yeah, 11 points. I, Air Force can score 50 on anybody they want, except you play a, a service academy that sucks, and it's a close game. I, it's, that's one of those where, like, two – Two wrongs don't make a right or something. I don't know the logic <laughs> yeah. behind it, but it was funny because they jumped out to a big lead and it was like, yeah, we don't need any more points. Yeah. Well, and that's probably smart. Just sit on it and see what happens. And they scored like a 96 yard touchdown in that game through the air. So whack game for Air Force in their win. But uh on to our over and unders this week as DY gloats there. I'll knock him down a peg here because he did not win the week in the best bets. That was Drew. He went three and two. Uh, Dean and I both went two and three. So with that, uh, our lead over Drew shrunk to just a game or a point, whatever you want to call it, heading into this next week. The first one, K-State pass attempts, 22 and a half. You guys both took the over. I took the under. Uh, it ended up being a lot closer than it probably would have felt to some people, especially with as much as Will Howard played in the game. But the Wildcats do go over just barely with 26 pass attempts in the game. So, what did you make of how K State threw the ball on Saturday, and and the decision on how often they did put it in the air? It seemed right to me because they weren't particularly efficient. There was at one point where I think they threw eight incomplete passes in a row. Finished fifteen of twenty six, not terrible, but just not overly efficient, especially with Avery Johnson in the passing game. But still, I, I interestingly enough, I, I probably still feel better about the passing game because you just had more weapons begin to emerge. Yeah. And really, by more weapons, you mean more weapon, and that would be Jace Brown. Yeah. But also, I guess the tight ends, the extra tight ends. Jared, Jared, so, yeah. Now, I don't know if the Will Swanson thing is sustainable because he's not yeah. a particular strong athlete, even though he caught a touchdown and he was pretty active. But Garrett Oakley had a really tight window catch, and he had a wide-open touchdown reception as well. It mm-hmm. just got called back. And – if Avery Johnson hits him, I mean, he was wide open at one point in the game right down the middle of the field. So another thing to take into consideration there. But, yes, uh, the, may, maybe you're right on the tight ends. I think, it, I, I think it'll be interesting to see moving forward with the passing game because it clearly dropped off immediately after Ben Sennett had to leave the game. And it took a while for the, the passing attack to get going again. And I just think that's because teams devote so much time and effort to stopping Ben Sennett because he is the legit top target in the passing game for K-State, that once he's not out there, it, it opens everything up for everybody else. So I, I think that it made it a little easier on TCU for a stretch, but K-State adjusted, and uh, we'll just have to see how it goes moving forward. I mean, there there are the numbers right there for the quarterbacks against TCU. Um, I mean, I, I thought both threw the ball well at times, Avery Johnson had two beautiful balls that he just threw in there to Jace Brown, and that was impressive. And I think fans said it best yesterday that uh, Avery Johnson clearly has the better touch of the two throwers for K-State right now, and uh, that might be something interesting to monitor moving forward. But both guys played well. They ran the ball well when they needed to, and uh, they were able to put it in the air just enough to, to keep TCU honest and move it. But you also 
can rely on these guys running the football and not having to throw when you also have running backs like K-State does where Treshawn Ward and DJ Giddens both go for over 80 yards individually and they were successful on the ground. So, I mean, it was – even though the numbers end up being lopsided, the approach that K-State could take to the game was pretty balanced in a way. I mean, Johnson and and Howard were both pretty similar in terms of their rushing numbers, same for Giddens and Ward, and then the passing wasn't drastically different. Um, I, I think it was, I mean, obviously you can tell by the way it played out with them being able to alternate quarterbacks every drive, but that was probably as, an ideal of a game that Chris Kleiman could have had for the situation they were in on Saturday. Yeah, he still threw for 244 yards and four touchdowns, by the yeah. way, which, you know, some of that a little fool's gold. I mean, DJ Giddens did a lot of the heavy lifting on, on one long score yeah. where he caught it, might have caught it behind the line of scrimmage, at the line of scrimmage, and ran the rest of the 60, 70 yards that it went for. There was a touchdown pass from Avery Johnson that was actually just a lateral but ended up forward. So yeah. some of those passing numbers are a bit deceiving, but still a good day. Uh, at, at, still a good day. Um, at the yard like I said you'd like to be a bit more efficient but the Will Howard is you know he missed us some things but he hit some things and yeah. Avery Johnson missed some things but he also dropped two dimes and Jace yep. Brown yep and and they didn't hurt him I mean the K-State was six of six in the red zone uh, over the weekend and also another thing I mean th- this that was one of the things I wanted to highlight they also went out, and the, the time of possession, in case they had the ball for almost 39 minutes of the game, and they scored 41 points. I mean, I think typically you would think of if a team had the ball for 39 of the 60 minutes in a the game, they, they're probably not scoring 41 points. They're probably a little bit lower than that. So the fact that they were still able to score and possess the ball for so long and even have some of those drives where they struck pretty quick uh, was impressive. And Chris Kleiman talked about how just important that first moment of the second half was where they stopped TCU on fourth down and then they killed like eight, nine minutes of clock. And basically the game was over from that point. So that was uh, certainly significant with how things ended up uh, playing out. Now on to the others from the weekend. So the total turnovers in the game, two and a half. uh, You and I were both over. So we were both wrong on this one. Drew was the only one that went under and, I really thought Josh Hoover was going to be in a position where he turned the ball over more. And then I figured that there would be at least one moment where it didn't matter which K-State quarterback it was. They both have reasons they could have thrown a pick uh, that are independent of each other. I just thought we would get to three somehow. But only one, Des Purnell made a heck of a play to even make sure that it wasn't zero in the game. Uh, what did you think of the the takeaway situation? Obviously good for the K-State offense that they didn't give it away. But defensively, maybe not the step that we thought there would be after the game against Texas Tech. Yeah, but I thought there were moments where they could and just didn't ball didn't bounce their way also. So it doesn't really alarm me, especially when you're giving the amount of stops that they were. Uh, another one that came down to the wire for us, K-State players with a reception, six and a half was the number. It turned out to be a great pick by Drew number-wise. He and I both took the over. You went under. Uh, this is, this is what you had. You said we could see Keegan Johnson and Garrett Oakley catch a pass. We know that Phillip Brooks and Ben Sinek catch one. Trayshawn Ward probably does too. Uh, and even then the under could still hit. So you had five guys that you thought catching a pass crazy enough. Keegan Johnson and Ben Sinek did not catch a pass in the game. Uh, it ended up being a, a handful of other guys with Jace Brown and then, Will uh, Will Swanson getting a catch. So, a little bit different how that worked out. I just kind of assumed that it would happen and it, it would have it had been Senate or Keegan Johnson caught a ball. And I'm with you. I thought there was no way that both of those guys would end up without a catch in the game. I mean, you, you force feed both of them for different reasons. Ben Senate because he's your your best, you know, pass catcher, and Keegan Johnson because you need to get the, the guy going. And when he's had the ball in his hands, he's been dynamic, but nope, didn't do either of those over the weekend. And they and were just, I got- I got lucky that the under hits here just because of the Ben Sennett injury, I believe. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ben Sennett probably would not have gone uh, without a catch if he had played the entire game. Jace Brown snaps 17 and a half. Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't even look to check on this one. I just am 49. fairly. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm fairly confident it was well over 17 and a half. It was so, almost 50. Uh, almost 50. Yeah. He is clearly, uh, I mean, 
Philip Brooks is probably still this, but I mean, is it, we're getting into the territory where we have to say that Jace Brown is wide receiver one on this team. Uh, you're probably not there yet. Um, trying to look at the other wide receiver snap counts as I say this. I mean, Phil Brooks still had 68 snaps. So he's not taking snaps away from Phil Brooks. 68 snaps for Phil Brooks, 50, 57 from Jaden Jackson, 49 for Jace Brown. Those were the three used the most. Keegan Johnson, 22. RJ Garcia, 9. Xavier Lloyd, 1. He's still young, and there's plenty of time, but, I mean, are we getting into the territory where we have to start to think that the Keegan Johnson thing might be a bust for K-State? I mean, we thought it was going to be impactful and a major deal, and now all of a sudden he's struggling to, to do much for him. But uh, he is still a sophomore, so he's still – and we're talking about an offense that's going to continue to evolve. This year, any – Production in the passing game should probably, from him, should probably be viewed as a bonus. But going forward, I don't think you have to call him a bust. Like we've seen a lot of stories in just a short time under Chris Kleiman, where a guy starts out slow, takes off later. Maybe he's someone that doesn't really emerge until next year. We'll see. I mean, they're still trying to count on him. They clearly see something. Yeah. He's he's offensive Julius Prince. Both both uh, Iowa boys. All right. Uh, rolling on, then the next one and uh, the last one, Khalid Duke tackles for a loss, one and a half. Uh, I took the under. I was the only one to do so. You and Drew both had the over. Um, I still thought that he would get at least something back there. He didn't, though. Uh, he ends up with no tackles for loss in the game, and I think if you, you go through and look, he may have ended up with just one tackle, and yeah, that's, that's what the number ends up being. He did get one hit on uh josh hoover though but uh nothing there i i you know the the numbers for k-state pressure wise they only ended up with two sacks and i don't know that it's indicative of how they were i think they've still been able to to get enough pressure to affect the quarterback in the last two games and, and make an impact there they just haven't been able to get a sack and josh hoover this is probably more so because of him being a, a freshman seemed a little antsy to move out of the pocket when things started to get rough and so he didn't really give him many opportunities to get him because he threw 20 incompletions in the game. I mean, he barely completed half of his passes. So uh, I'm not too worried about it for the K-State defense. I just think it's indicative of uh, the quarterback that they were playing. Yeah, they, they still made a life uncomfortable for Josh Hoover. I just don't think the it showed up necessarily in a box score. Yeah, no, I would uh, I would definitely agree with that. So. I guess we'll uh, we'll see how next week goes. But the uh, official standings now, you and I still in a, just a dead heat first place, 22-16 and 16 now for both of us. And then Drew has uh, slid to 21-17. and 17. So it's going to be a tight race all season. Uh, we really not had anybody want to separate too much this year. So looking forward to the lines that Drew will set for the Houston game this coming weekend. All right, so we've talked about the TCU game. That is in the rearview mirror. Houston is on the docket now for the Wildcats. Uh, what are some of the, the key storylines that you're going to be keeping an eye on this week as the Cougars come to Manhattan? Take care of business. Don't, you know, it's going to be easy to peek ahead to that Texas game because of the stakes and potential ramifications of it. Um, you're probably going to be very well in the spotlight for that particular weekend you're probably going to have a great television slot a great time slot a lot of eyeballs and a great you know stage to really advertise and promote your program as being the one of the preeminents in the big 12 both currently and in the future so it's going to be easy to look ahead to that game You've done that before, though. You, you you probably didn't take Oklahoma State seriously enough, and it cost you. Don't let that happen twice. Um, Houston has a pulse. They they took Texas to the wire. They beat West Virginia. This is a team that's still bottom of the barrel, or at least close to it, when it comes to the Big 12. But Houston is putting up a fight and probably a bit more respectable than what meets the eye. 
Yeah, no, I would uh, I would agree with that. And, and uh, look, I, Houston, we've probably made fun of them a lot this year, as we did with a lot of the bad teams at various points for the Big Twelve. But th- they they are competent offensively. Like they will make things happen. They will make you uncomfortable, and you're going to have to be ready to to just battle with them, as Texas found out this past week. So I mean that. And Donovan Smith is a guy that he, you know, he played well in Manhattan last year, well enough. K State was able to force a couple turnovers, but uh, Texas Tech was able to kind of make that thing stretch out and not necessarily be in hand comfortably for K State by the end of the game. So I, you know, I, I look forward to to seeing that. But this is probably a better test for the K State defense this week than it is the K State offense. I think, in theory, we should probably see a lot of the same out of K State this coming week. I. I think the one thing that's going to be significant, though, is trying to determine is Chris Kleiman and Conkline just going to decide, hey, we, last week it was nice and it was easy for us to just balance back and forth. We're going to have to make a decision here on riding with one guy more than the other, and you probably need to see that in-game before you take it to Austin, where maybe it's not as important now that Texas is going to be on a backup quarterback with Quinn Ewer's injury, but I still think you're going to have to go into that game with a clear cut. This is the guy at quarterback. We're not deviating from it. We got to ride with him for quite a while. And then, of course, if something is going bad, you know, in the third quarter of that game, you make the switch. You try and win that game at all costs because that is a very gettable game now and one that you need to have. So I just think that's probably something that the offense has to figure out this week. But other than that, like, I think they should be able to do a lot of the same things they did against TCU scoring the ball. I mean, TCU and Houston are probably pretty comparable defensively this year, if you think about it, uh, in terms of of how easy it's been for their opponents. But defensively, this is where the corners are going to get tested again and probably a pretty good warm-up test for what they'll get next week against Texas because Houston has some big physical receivers. Donovan Smith will throw it a lot. So you're going to have to be ready for it, and uh, this is going to be a good opportunity. Yeah, they can be – Houston can be explosive as an offense, so that is something to really consider, and it will test Kansas State on the boundary because of it. Um, From a quarterback perspective, in terms of the Wildcats, I would expect it to look a lot like Texas Tech and TCU. Now, you say, well, those two games didn't really match up. You kind of just went Avery in the second half and you alternated every series against TCU. I think the game plan was technically the same. Now, because, you know, one of the things that Chris Clement says, what we wanted to do was we'll have our first drive, Avery Johnson second drive, and we'll go from there. Going from there, matriculated into an alternation every series. They didn't have to. That's just what they chose to do based off what they were seeing. I think that's kind of what it was in Lubbock, although I think it was two series, two series, and then it went from there. I think you get that against Houston, and if it works again, you get that against Texas. I, I think Will Howard gets the first series or two. Then they go, go to Avery Johnson. And then the rest is just game feel based on the flow in the script. Yeah. Uh, Donovan Smith, this might surprise some people. Uh, this season, completing 67% of his passes, he's 21 yards shy of 2,000 passing yards already. And he's 16 to four on his touchdown to interception ratio. He's played pretty well for Houston. And as I mentioned, and I've talked about at various points this year, they have a receiving unit that has size and has some skill there. Like Houston is not three and four and one and three in the Big 12 because of their offense. It is solely based on their defense and how teams have been able to kind of maneuver. And I will say this, at least uh, to discredit their offense a little bit, it's come on late in some games. Uh, They've struggled at various points early. So this is another situation where K-State could be facing a team that if you just go out there and you kind of put it on them early, we'll, we'll see what happens and, and maybe you can break their spirits pretty quickly. And this is going to be tough for Houston too because this is an environment that they will not be accustomed to. And I think we saw that with UCF. Obviously, there are some teams in the American that aren't you know the worst, but I think it's a little different for you uh, when you get to into these environments. And Houston struggled in their only Big 12 road trip of the season so far. They went to Lubbock and lost by 21. And if you look around, like, they have not had to face anything like this in the last couple of years. I mean, I'm looking at 
past Houston schedules, and their most rowdy road game was probably at SMU last year, and they lost 77-63 to 63 in that game. Um, but they they have not had like these uh, tough road matchups in their past to kind of grasp. This is going to be a different environment, and I bet they struggle the same way we see we saw UCF and TCU kind of do uh, in Manhattan this year. Should be a, an easy time for the Wildcats as long as they stay focused and do what they got to do, which I think it's a good sign that they came out and they did that to TCU a week after what happened in Lubbock because it shows that they were focused and ready to go. So we'll just have to see uh, what goes on moving forward. All right, rolling on here. Uh, let's take a look at the Big 12 scoreboard from the weekend, get DY's thoughts on this. We talked about it yesterday on the Sunday show. Uh, second straight week, somebody apologized to Mike Gundy, and that was fan this week. So he had to get his apology in because Oklahoma State, they are in the same position as K-State right now, believe it or not. Uh, K-State and Texas and Iowa State. So shout out to all those schools battling for second place. Uh, Oklahoma very easily could have been tied with all those schools uh, in the one loss column if they had just blown it against UCF. Fortunately for them, they did not. They survived by two. Baylor, the field goal win over Cincinnati. O-State, two-score win over West Virginia that they pulled away late. Texas played with fire at Houston. It was the second largest crowd uh, in Houston's history down there. And the picture that Houston posted, I saw a lot of burnt orange and Texas hats. Uh, BYU cruises to a win over Texas Tech. It wasn't even as close as 27 to 14. And then we know what K-State did. So from the games this weekend, uh, which Big 12 performance kind of stood out to you, good or bad? K-State, good. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. 41 to 3 over the Frogs. Um, trying to think here. Texas beating Houston is... By seven, you would have thought the Longhorns would have done more. But the biggest takeaway there would probably be Quinn Ewers um, being injured more than anything. I thought the most disappointing performance was probably Oklahoma. You're at home against UCF. You had a bye week to recover from the high that was the Texas game, and that's the product you threw out there. That just shows you that under Brent Venables, they, they probably – you know, I'm going to doubt that they have the discipline to remain undefeated against this lackluster slate. If they can, you know, refocus with a with a bye week against the and allow UCF to grab their attention and, and to kind of hone in on that, then I, if I was a Sooner fan, I would worry about not getting up for the remainder of the schedule. That's also going to be a bit lackluster in terms of grabbing their attention when they don't have a bye week to recover. So, I would sound the alarm bells a little bit on the Oklahoma Sooners just having the discipline and the mindset to remain undefeated, even when they're going to be the overwhelming favorite, because they, they almost felt victim of that, even with the bye week. And and clearly, as you said, and as you know, fan apologized to Mike Gundy as well, Oklahoma state at this point is a team to be reckoned with. And look, I still think they're bad enough to lose to just about anyone else remaining on their schedule, but they're also good enough to go undefeated the rest of the way. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's probably oh, the right way to look at and it. Texas, and Texas Tech might be dead. Yeah, no, I think I think you have to call them dead at this point because yeah. five losses right now, and the games left TCU at home in two weeks, uh, at KU, home against UCF, and at Texas. So you have to go, you know, and and win three of those final five games, or I guess uh, four games for them. And I just I I don't see it like. All those teams there could beat them. I mean, there's a, there's a realm where they go 0 and 4 in those games. More likely than not, I bet that they probably go 1 and 3. But it's just tough to see them getting to the number that they need. And uh, I mean, the recruiting classes are good for Joey McGuire right now. So there's at least a little bit of hope there. But they've obviously got their issues that they kind of want to work through and and get down to business on. So we'll just have to to see there. Uh, I I will say this. Uh, I think. We are starting to learn and get confirmation. You're probably not going to have to worry about Baylor too hard on the schedule later in the year if you're K-State. Um, they have shown to be a competent team against teams that are just worse off than them right now. And those schools have been UCF and Cincinnati, newcomers to the Big 12. They they still have not shown up and been competitive in a game against a school that has you know currently been here, has adjusted to Big 12 life for a while. So Baylor still, even with the win that I thought they would get, didn't concern me. 
It's back to back weeks since Cincinnati loses at home as a uh, home favorite. So interesting there. Uh, I, honestly, I mean, Mike Gundy, I'm not going to apologize to him like everybody seems to be doing um, because all the, the signs and the ingredients were there that this was going in a negative direction for him. But he proved he can still coach. And uh, them going and putting almost 50 up on the road when they were struggling there for a little bit and then just pulled away at the end, that's impressive to me. They, you're right that they could lose to anybody left on their schedule, and it wouldn't be surprising because – Alan Bowman is your quarterback, uh, but they are playing really well right now, and they probably have the best running back in the league in Ollie Gordon with how he's playing. I mean, he was well over 200 yards on the ground against West Virginia, and uh, Texas uh, Oklahoma State is a legitimate contender right now based on how they've played the last three weeks. And based on what the remaining schedule looks like, I'm not going to apologize to Mike Gundy either because I was a believer, uh, maybe not a believer after they lost to South Alabama by all his four touchdowns at home. Hey, but I took Oklahoma State over six and a half wins this year because I – okay, no, I didn't believe in Oklahoma State. It's just that I I also didn't believe in the teams that they were going to play. That was a soft schedule, so I took over six and a half wins, not because I thought Oklahoma State would be good, because I thought their schedule would be bad, and, and I'm still probably thinking that it's the latter rather than the former. Yeah. All right, well, that uh, that will do it for the Big 12 scoreboard there. Uh, any final thoughts before we close up shop on uh, this Monday edition of the KSO Show? Uh, I would say this is a, a self-discipline game for Kansas State. Don't look ahead. Take care of business. Uh, don't don't peak, you know, what's in, you know, almost two weeks from now. Uh, show your maturity and, and prepare for Houston. Don't peak at Texas. Yeah, uh, I I will peek at Texas for them. I am peeking at that game very hard right now. Um, although I am very, I'm excited to just have another home game back to back after you know a month a eight month away from Manhattan. So yeah, eight eight 11 a.m. Yeah, Beautiful. you don't have to you don't have to stay in someone else's apartment house, uh, and you can drive beautiful. home. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, look, I was hoping that by the time we finished recording today for everybody, we would know the game time for Texas and K-State uh, because that will be significant. I, I can say this, though. It won't be the ABC game. They're still going to do Washington-USC uh, for that primetime ABC game, which is kind of funny considering all the USC you know hilarity that's ensued. But this does mean that K-State-Texas are going to be the 11 a.m. game on Fox or like the 6, 7 o'clock game on Fox uh, because those two windows are still open. What so, about 2.30, 2.30 ABC? Uh, 2.30 ABC, I guess, would probably be in play. I, I did not study hard enough to make sure, but I believe that it would still be in play. So it could happen. That was uh, that was the slot that the game in 2019 got between K-State and Texas. Um, now, that was not as good of a Texas team and not necessarily the same situation, but uh, I would say similar scenarios there and everything uh, playing out. Um, actually, 2.30 ABC. Um, let's see. No, I think it is still open. So that, that could be in play for, for K-State. We'll just have to, to wait and see. But do you have a preference? I mean, you're, you're the one that's going to be in Austin, so this is, this is catering to you. Do you want the, the pressure of Big Noon? I don't think K-State has ever – well, I guess they, they beat OU in 20. I was going to say they don't think they've ever won a Big Noon game. But they have lost to – Texas before in this game, they have lost to Arkansas State in a, a big noon situation. Uh, do you want the 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 pressure of big noon following K State in Texas? Yeah, it would be. I think it would be fun. I, I was hoping that this game wouldn't be a night game, so I'm actually okay. Thanks, thankful that it isn't because I leave from Vegas in the morning. No. So I thought I you were just gonna say you were gonna you wanted to get a head start and get there Saturday night. No, no. I leave for Vegas, fly from Austin to Vegas on Sunday morning. So, uh, you know, I was a, a little nervous about Kansas State and Texas being like a 7 o'clock kick and not getting back and probably getting like an hour of sleep, which I've already done feels like a couple of times this year. So, nope, I'm okay with it. Anything but a night game. I, I Look, I like night games, but it, it's, it's, the, it's gassed me this year already. Yeah, there's been there have been a lot of them. Uh so that's that's tough. And I mean, if this ends up being another 11 a.m., well, if it's 11 a.m. or night, th those will continue to be the only 
kick times that K-State has had this season. There has been no in-between. So if you're somebody that likes that middle-of-the-day kickoff that feels like you know fall Big 12 football, you're not getting it this year. You are either getting up early or you're staying up late. There is no in-between for you. Yeah. My guess is this is – this might be 2.30. This might be. This is uh, This is just, I, I think what it's going to come down to is Fox has to make the decision on, do you want Bedlam at 11 a.m. or do you want the possibility of Arch Manning at 11 a.m.? Yeah, yeah, you know why this is grueling for Fox. It's like, this is the last Bedlam, so woo, big time. Yeah, that's right? true. Or, or you have this underlying storyline that's starting to brew that it could be Avery Johnson versus Arch Manning. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to find out. We are finishing this at 11.55. I guarantee you the second that I hit in recording and I start uploading it, we're going to get the TV times. And uh, that's just how this goes. So uh, we'll see if we were right, wrong, how it works out. Doesn't matter, though, because as D.Y. said, the focus is on Houston this week. No looking ahead. Cats, Cougars, 11 a.m. this weekend. We will be back on Wednesday recapping Chris Kleiman's Tuesday press conference, which, by the way, if you want to watch as soon as it is done, you can get over on the uh, K-State Online YouTube page. So make sure that you're subscribed there. Sign up for those notifications. Those will be helpful. And then also follow along with everything going on over at kstateonline.com with uh, on three because we have plenty of recruiting information this week. The Wildcats just picked up another commitment. Feels like the first time in forever that K-State added to the uh, 2024 class and then also plenty of other updates to do with guys that visited this weekend, potential visitors for this weekend, and uh, also some of the uh, stories from Friday night where Drew and I were out catching high school football. So a lot to dive into and uh, the best place to do it with K-State is over at K-State Online. So that will do it for Derek Young and I. I'm Mason Voth. We're back on Wednesday. Thanks for watching the KSO Show.